Welcome to the series, Understanding the Goodness of God. And in understanding the goodness of God, many things will start to change in your life. And it will be always for the better, always for your growth, always for your healing. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much, my Father. Thank you, my God. For your immense goodness it has no end it has my father no expiration date because everything about you is good and everything that you do is good thank you O oh god for isaiah 61 verse 4 that says then they will rebuild the ancient ruins they will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. And also Joel 3.16 says, The Lord will be the place of repair for his people. Once we start knowing your goodness, my Lord, we will be able to go out and repair desolations and ancient ruins and generational um, curses of people that have believed things that are erroneous about you, my Father. And Lord, thank you, thank you, that soldiers may be wounded in battle and sent to the hospital. A hospital isn't a shelf, it is a place of repair. A soldier on service in the spiritual army is never off his battlefield. He is only removed to another part of the field when a wound interrupts what he meant to do and sets him doing something else. Is it not joy, pure joy, that there is no question of the, of the shelf? No soldier on service is ever laid aside, Lord God. He is the only given another commission to fight among the unseen forces of the field. Never is he shelved as of no further use to his beloved captain, my God. The soldier must let his captain say when and for how long. A wise master never wastes his servant's time, nor a commander his soldier. So let us settle it once and for all and find heart's ease in doing so. There is no discharge in warfare. No, no, not for a single day. We may be called to serve on the visible field, going continuously into the invisible, both to renew our strength and to fight the kind of battle that can only be fought there. Or we may be called off the visible altogether for a while and drawn deep into the invisible. That dreary word laid aside is never for us, my God. For we are soldiers, my Father, in your kingdom, soldiers for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But before we go out to battle, before we get strong in the things of you, my Father, the first thing we need to understand and we need to believe and we need to trust, my God, that you are good and that everything, my Father, that you intend for us is good. And we thank you for this series understanding the goodness of God. We thank you, my God, for speaking to my heart and thank you for this lesson today. And I pray that you will strengthen me and I pray that you will, by the power of your spirit, speak through me. And I thank you in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to the Goodness of God series. The name of our devotional today is God Isn't Confused. And the Bible verse that we're going to be exploring today 
is Deuteronomy 28, and it starts with verse 1, the blessing for obedience, and then Deuteronomy uh, 28.15 is when it starts speaking about all of the effects of disobedience, and which brings on a curse. So traditional religion has made people think that they cannot depend on the goodness of God. Religion has taught that one day God makes us sick and the next day he might make us poor. And, and so there are preachers that have even said that God gives us things like sickness and poverty. I went to a traditional uh, religion school. I don't want to mention the religion, but I also learned that God was a punishing God, that God um, gave sicknesses and, and um, destruction and things like that to teach us. Uh, but the religious tradition is really contrary to the written word of God. God is not confused about good and evil. He knows the definition of a blessing and a curse and his our view of a blessing from him. In Deuteronomy 28, you can read the blessings and the curses as he described them to the nation of Israel. He sums up the blessing in verses 11 through 13, and it reads, the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all of the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, you shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. In other words, the blessings of obedience are, of course, looking at it in the terms of uh, livestock and uh, farming, in terms of what the commerce was in the time of Jesus. It was that. Uh, they commerced with, with their livestock and that was basically the, the majority of the, um, of the product of whatever country it was. You were rich if you had a lot of cattle. You, would, you were rich if you had land. You were rich if you had um, fields to plant and to uh, to gather a harvest and so the Lord is speaking about that we shall lend to many nations and not borrow why because when we borrow money from other people or from a bank or f or from a credit card company we get into debt and it is really slavery according to the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. That means that we, when we are children of the Most High God and we are walking in obedience, we will have positions of management. We will own companies. We will be in positions of administration, of government, and so on and so forth. Later in the chapter, the Lord names every sickness, every disease, and all kinds of lack and calls them a curse. He summarizes the evil of that curse by saying, your life shall hang in doubt before you. And of course, he's talking about the disobedience of not believing in God, the disobedience of not believing in his son, the disobedience of 
following a life of sin and not following a life of God. And we see that nowadays more and more each day. We need to look around us. We need to analyze. We need to understand what is happening in the world today. Um, babies are being killed, but yet uh, a man that dresses up like a woman, it's totally fine. And so there is very severe contrast from one thing to another. It's like going to extremes that do, that do not make sense. And so there is a disobedience because when you don't believe in God, when you don't follow his son Jesus, okay, it you are going against God basically. You are an enemy of the kingdom of God. And so you it says that when when we walk in disobedience, uh the the, the Lord in Deuteronomy um 15 it says that your life shall hang in doubt before you you shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life in the morning you shall say oh if that it were evening and in the evening you shall say oh that it were morning because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see obviously god has figured out what is good for us and what is not he knows it's good when we have more than enough natural provisions in our life of course he understands that we need enough provisions so that we can meet our needs and he always wants to give us a little more so that we can help others and that is what a principle of generosity is all about he knows that if we plant crops it's good to reap out a big harvest he knows that if we have livestock, it's good for them to increase. He knows it's good for our children to be blessed and for us to be physically healthy and whole. On the other hand, he knows it's evil for us to be sick, poor, frightened, and oppressed. Actually, the Hebrew word for shalom that the Lord uses so frequently to bless his people means to have wholeness in your life spirit soul and body it means you have nothing missing nothing broken god knows that is the way things ought to be and that is the way he wants them to be not just for a few of his people but for every one of his people as it says in psalm 145 9 the lord is good to all you would think everybody would be thrilled to hear that god is good but the fact is, it often upsets religious people, especially preachers. And there are many men of God that have preached a message of uh, doom and a message of destruction and a message that God uh, does bring sickness and does bring poverty to his people. Uh, historically, in the 1940s, there were uh, pastors that were preaching that and um, and people were getting sick and and uh, and they were getting sicker and sicker by the day. And of course, there were other preachers that started to um, speak about that God is good and that the goodness of God will bring on your healing because God is a healer. God doesn't want you to be, he want, doesn't want you to be sick and, and busted and living under a bridge and asking for money on the highway. God wants you to have good things. He wants you to live in a house. He wants you to have a job. He wants you to be a good pillar of, uh, of good moral character in your community and he wants you to raise your children correctly and he wants you to speak about the word of God at the dinner table. He wants the man to be the head of the house and the woman uh, to be the helper of the man and to rear the children in the word of God, teach them the way that they shall go and they will not depart from the law or the word of God. 
God. And so you see children that go to Christian group, uh, youth groups and, and that they are um, taken to church from an early age and you see other children that do not go to church and there are major problems. There are problems with anger. There are problems with uh, lacking in their schoolwork. There are problems in children uh, watching and playing uh, Nintendo and those games that, that numb a part of the brain, which is the receptacles to empathy, and they go out and kill people. And so plugging your child in to faith and taking them to church and having them do sports and all those wholesome activities um, will yield a mighty harvest. It will form the character of your children in a um, good moral character, which is what we need in this world today. Who is going to be the, the presidents and the, um, the men of the cabinet and of the government uh, in our generation? Uh, is it men of good standing, men of good moral character, men that believe in God or women for that, for that matter? Um, or is it going to be, you know, people that, that uh, don't have integrity, so on and so forth? And so um, the messages of the message of healing is a very important message because God is a healer. God is a healer unequivocally without a shadow of a doubt. And we just need to believe that he is and we need to uh, walk in obedience. We need to believe in God, have faith, and, um, and basically stand on the word of God and read those Bible verses of healing and basically make them part of your life and read them and declare them back to God. In other words, pray them back to God if you have an infirmity and God is faithful and God will heal. He healed uh, the people in his day and he will continue to heal the people in our day. And there was, there's a story of a pastor that was preaching the goodness of God and someone from the congregation uh, later uh, created a rebuttal for him and said, you shouldn't be preaching about the goodness of God. You're going to confuse people. And so the pastor said, so what do you want me to preach on? The, the lack of goodness or the evil of God? I can't do that because the essence of God is good. And so the, the, the sermon or the pastor that was preaching about healing and about restoration and about transformation and about um, breakthroughs, all of these things that we can believe in, um, they were having uh, tens of thousands of people being saved and sick people being healed. Why? Because we need to tell the world that God is good. We need to tell the world that God heals, that God is good, that there is no evil and no wickedness in God, that that is brought about, okay, a brought about religion and the, the message of religion, which has nothing to do with the message of relationship. And it is in relationship that we find all of the goodness of God. You can be sure, you can be totally sure that the goodness of God is there. It is there for everyone. And it is there for us to take it, receive it, 
and believe that we receive when we pray, Mark 11. So the question for this um, study is, what, why is it important for you to understand the depths of God's goodness? And how will this knowledge change you? The other question is, are you afraid to trust God wholly with your life's circumstances? And if so, why? Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are not a man that you would lie. You're very clear, my God, what is a curse and what is a blessing. My Father, thank you so much for uh, speaking to my heart regarding bringing the goodness of God in this subject matter to your people, to your uh, sons and to your daughters, my Father. Let's just remove the lies right off the bat so that we can move forward in our maturity. We can move forward in our victory, my God, by the power and by the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that we are believing that you are good. Thank you, O oh God. And I just pray that you will bless each one of my subscribers, O oh God. My Father, it is the numbers are growing, God, and for that, I thank you. I ask you to bless every area of their lives, and I ask you to show up and show each and every one of them the goodness that you have for them. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray and I thank you. Amen, Lord God.